This video discusses the windowing method, which is a popular method for designing finite impulse response filters. The principles involved in the windowing method are outlined here at the top of the slide. I'm showing the windowing property of the DTFT, where we start with an idealized filter, that's H sub I of N, this is its impulse response, and we multiply by a window function uh, to obtain our practical filter um, H of N. The DTFT property says that uh, the corresponding operation in the frequency domain is a periodic convolution. It's a convolution of the ideal frequency response with the Fourier transform of the window function. Now um, I'm showing down below some uh, plots in the time domain that's on the top and then on the frequency in the frequency domain on the bottom. The, uh, the things to notice here are in the time domain, on the left we're looking at the response of the ideal filter. Typically the ideal filter has an infinite impulse response. In this case you can see it's a sync kind of a behavior and it continues on to plus and minus infinity. I'm only showing about uh, 20 or 30 samples here. Over on the right hand side uh, we see the window function in blue. Uh, here I'm plotting it as if it were a continuous function. Remember that it's a, a discrete sequence that's equal to 0 out here in the tails and it's equal to 1 in the middle. Um, when you multiply that window function times the infinitely long impulse response of the ideal filter, you get a finite length uh, impulse response. That's the stem plot in orange. And you can see that in the tails, uh, that is equal to zero. And that's what the window function does, is it sets to zero everything that's not contained within the window itself. Um, here I'm showing the window amplitude as 0.2. It's actually equal to one. So it doesn't change the amplitude of the impulse response values, but I, I scaled it down just to fit it on the plot. And uh, the things, a couple of things to note that we'll come back to is that the window in the time domain has a length, and you can see that here it goes from time 0 up to time 20. Um, so it has length 21 samples. And it also has a shape. The, the one shown here is a rectangular shape where it's constant across the aperture of the window, but it doesn't have to be that way. The, these windows can take on different shapes as we'll see. So a window has two properties, a length and a shape. Down below we're looking at uh, what happens in the frequency domain. So here we have the response of the ideal filter, which has uh, a gain of 1 in a pass band and a gain of 0 in the stop band. I'm also showing in orange here the Fourier transform of the window function. And uh, the properties of the window function that we're going to want to pay attention to are the fact that it has a main lobe, which is the center portion here, and then it has these side lobes which decay as you move away from the main lobe. What the Fourier transform property says is that we're, we should, con to, to obtain the Fourier transform of the practical filter, we convolve the ideal filter response with the window function in the frequency domain. So when we convolve the orange with this idealized blue filter, um, we get this uh, plot that you see over here on the right. A couple of things to note are that uh, whereas the ideal filter has a constant gain in the pass band and the stop bands, the um, practical filter has ripples in those two bands. So instead of having a perfect gain of one across the band in the pass band, we'll have um, a little bit of uh, gain above one and gain less than one for frequencies that enter uh, through in the pass band. And then in the stop band, instead of having infinite attenuation, we have these ripples so that uh, some signals at these frequencies will leak through. Um, the other feature of the um, ideal filter is that there is an infinitely sharp transition from the pass band to the stop band, uh, whereas the practical filter has a 
uh, finite transition band uh, where we, uh, it's a band of frequencies over which we transition from the pass band edge to the start of the stop band. And these are effects that we just have to live with when we're dealing with finite length filters. Um, this is an animation that shows the convolution um, happening. So you see that as the um, main lobe of the window function uh, slides across the tran transition band of the ideal filter, we get um, this, well, the edge of the ideal filter, we get this transition band where the uh, response of the practical filter rises from near zero to near one, that's the transition band, uh, and the same thing happens at uh, the, the uh, cutoff frequency and the positive frequency part of the uh, response. And then um, the other thing that we see happening is that the ripples are, are in here and um, they're giving rise, the, the, uh, the side lobes of the window function are giving rise to the ripples that we see in, in the pass band and in the stop band. So again, there, there's two effects taking place. We get uh, the, the transition bandwidth that you see in the practical response is uh, a function of the main lobe width of the window function. And then the size of the ripples uh, is related to the size of the side lobes of the window function. So we would generally like to have very small um, ripples. And to get small ripples in the practical response, we're going to need to have small side lobes in the window. The other thing we'd like to have is a very fast transition uh, from stop band to pass band and, and vice versa. And so we would generally like to have a very narrow main lobe in our window function. Uh, this illustrates some of those same principles, but now calling attention a little bit more to the uh, width of the transition band being related to the width of the main lobe of the window function, and we would generally like that to be small, so we generally we would like a narrow main lobe. And then also we would like to have small ripple in the two bands, the pass band and the stop band, and to achieve small ripple, uh, we would like to have small side lobes in the window function. Here's a few principles, then, that we've distilled from looking at these examples. Uh, they're, they're summarized here in two statements at the bottom of this slide. The window main lobe width is controlled by the shape and length of the window function in the time domain. And the window side lobe height is controlled only by the shape. So if you change the length of the window in the time domain, it doesn't change the, the height of the side lobes. Uh, it only influences the length or, or the width of the main lobe. Uh, these are some pictures taken from our textbook. Uh, in the top, we're looking at different uh, shapes for uh, windows that are commonly used. Uh, there are five pictured here. The first one is the rectangular window, which is flat across the top. The, uh, the second one, the solid line, is known as the Hamming window. This next one is the Hanning or Von Hahn. That's the dashed line. Um, the Blackman is the dashed dot line, and, uh, and so on. So you can see that um, even though it, it looks like maybe there's not a big difference between these windows in the time domain, um, they actually, you can see quite a difference when you take them into the frequency domain. So here we have the Fourier transform of the rectangular window, and then the triangular or the Bartlett window. That's pictured over here, so there's a, a triangular window. Um, notice that compared to the rectangular window, it has a wider main lobe and the side lobes are much smaller. These side lobes are down around, um, oh, about 13 decibels down from the main lobe in the rectangular window. But in the triangular window, they're, they're down quite a bit more, maybe about 25 dB. Um, the next one here is the Hanning or the Von Hahn window. It also has a wider main lobe than the rectangular, and its side lobes are down about 30 or 31 dB, and its side lobes decay pretty rapidly by comparison. The Hamming window 
again a wide a wide main lobe but uh, fairly flat side lobes and notice how far down they are they're all down about 40 or, or 41 decibels relative to the main lobe and then the Blackman its side lobes are down almost 60 dB and they decay but it has a very wide main lobe so th so the general principle here is that um, what we gain in side lobes we generally have to sacrifice in main lobe width so the lower the side lobes generally speaking the wider the main lobe but again remember we can make the main lobe as narrow as we want to by controlling the length of the window so all of these windows have the same length that's maintained the only thing that's changing here is the shape of the window so if we, we could obtain for example a window whose main lobe is as narrow as this rectangular one using a Blackman window so we could find a Blackman window whose main lobe is as narrow as the rectangular window shown here but it, and it has lower side lobes but it would necessarily be a longer uh, window in the time domain this table again taken from the textbook shows the peak side lobe level of the windows um, and it also gives us a formula for the approximate width of the main lobe where here M is the order of the uh, the filter that we're going to design the length is M plus 1 so going back we could um, we can see how we, we can see here how controlling the width of the main lobe is going to affect the transition bandwidth and the side lobe height is going to affect the amount of ripple in these other bands so if we wanted to have uh, a window let's say a low pass filter with very low side lobes very little ripple in the pass band and the stop bands we would probably want to choose a Blackman window but that would lead to a uh, a filter with a very wide transition band and so um, how could we solve the problem well make the make the filter longer and then you'll have a narrower transition band we'll look at some examples of this I want to go back to a slide that I've shown previously there uh, just to remember these principles there's four types of generalized linear phase filters those are the kinds of filters we will um, want to design in many cases. Um, the four types have different kinds of symmetry. Two of them have even symmetry about their midpoint. Two of them have odd symmetry about their midpoint. Um, two of these filters, types one and three, have even order and two of them, types two and four, have odd order. And the importance of uh, making note of the order of the filter is that the group delay for these generalized linear phase filters uh, the group delay is half of the order so here a represents the group delay um, and that's going to be m over 2 so m, o m over 2 is going to be an integer or it could be an integer plus one half and these are the only cases that um, we can find that lead to linear phase and constant group delay um, again we've seen this picture before this has to do with the, the different types of filters the symmetries that we'll see in the impulse responses and also it gives us clues about what kinds of filters we can use these uh, these different four different types of filters for um, generally speaking type 1 uh, for many applications is preferred because there's no structural constraints on the locations of zeros whereas for types 2 3 and 4 we have these structural constraints on on zeros being present that can't be removed for those types of filters and so we would only want to use type 2 for example as a low pass filter because it, its response at high frequencies has to be zero um, and similar statements could be made for types 3 and 4 alright let's continue our discussion of designing finite impulse response filters using the windowed filter design technique let's begin uh, now to talk about filter specifications usually a design problem is uh, first presented using a specification and uh, we'll look at some examples of this in a few minutes um, this uh, chart here uh, represents um, a diagram that you should be able to draw for a given specification 
And there's a lot of different ways the response could, of the desired filter could be specified. In this example, we're going to look at a low-pass filter, but the same principles can apply to other kinds of filters, such as band-pass filters, band-stop filters, high-pass, etc. Um, so in this diagram, uh, the x-axis is the frequency axis, and I'm only showing the frequencies from 0 to 1 half, positive frequencies, because um, uh, we know that there's some symmetry properties. We can reconstruct negative frequencies as the mirror image of the positive frequencies. And we're focused here on the magnitude response, not uh, thinking so much about the phase response, which uh, we generally will be wanting to be linear phase, and so that's why we're going to ignore that for the time being. Uh, the black line that you see here represents the magnitude response of the ideal filter. So we start with an ideal filter and um, its impulse response, which in this case would be a sync function. Um, and then we uh, have some specifications on how closely we want the realized filter to approximate the ideal filter. So the blue line here represents the response of the practical filter that's realized and implemented. This is the one that we design. And we want the blue line to be as close as possible to the black line. And so in the pass band, we want there um, to you know, we want these ripples that you see here to be as small as possible. And in the stop band, again, we want these ripples uh, to be small. The size of the ripple in the pass band, uh, or, or the error, is going to be given by these parameters delta p, which gives us the, um, the magnitude of the error away from the ideal response. And then in the stop band, the parameter is delta s. This is the size of the error in the stop band. So what we do is we, um, a, given a delta p parameter, we're required to keep the response of our, of our practical filter inside these bands that, that you see here. Also, the same applies in the stop band. We don't want our filter, our designed filter, to um, leave this envelope that's um, defined by this delta s parameter. Um, also on the frequency axis, there's a couple of frequencies that we're going to want to pay attention to. One is the pass band edge frequency, the stop band edge frequency, um, the cutoff frequency. This is usually the average of the pass and stop band edges, and so it lies halfway in between. And then there is the transition band width. Uh, we'll call that delta F. So that's the, the, the width of the transition band. Um, the pass band edge frequency is the frequency um, at which the response leaves this um, uh, spec specified envelope. And so uh, we're going to say that this is the edge of the pass band. And then also the stop band edge frequency is the, the frequency at which the response enters the envelope of the stop band. Now there's some, sometimes uh, we'll, we'll specify the amount of uh, attenuate or, or the amount of ripple in the pass band using a number expressed in decibels. So we'll call that number AP. And then also we'll sometimes have the stop band attenuation expressed as a number in decibels as well. We'll call that number AS. At the bottom of the page, you can see uh, the relationships between um, some of these variables, the errors uh, as they relate to the, the ripple and the stop band attenuations and uh, you have formulas that go from uh, deltas or, or from the, the db expressions into the linear error expressions and then you also have formulas that go the other direction. The center frequency again that's going to be the average of the stop and pass band edges and the um, transition bandwidth is going to be the difference between the stop band edge and the pass band edge. Mathematically um, we see, uh, we'll see expressions that look like this sometimes so it, it tells us that the magnitude response needs to stay within this envelope over this band of frequencies. And a similar statement can be made in the stop band. The magnitude response has to stay less than some number over the, the frequencies in the stop band. Um, the uh, procedure for designing a filter um, could be reduced to um, a flowchart or a recipe like we see here. 
And um, what I've done is gone into various different books and resources and tried to condense this down into a flowchart that's easy to follow. <clears throat> the, the whole process really is not very difficult. Um, I want to emphasize that there's a piece that's not shown here, and that is computing the idealized impulse response. Remember, on the previous slide, we started with a low-pass filter design. So what we do is we start with the um, ideal frequency response in the frequency domain. And notice that it has a cutoff frequency at this, fr at this value fc. Given that magnitude response, we take out pencil and paper and we we calculate the impulse response of the ideal filter. We know in this case it's a sync function and that's shown here where omega c is 2 pi times the cutoff frequency fc. Um, so that's where this um, uh, sync function comes from. I'll note that if in, instead of having a, a filter design problem for a low pass filter, if, in, if we were designing say a, low, or, or a band pass filter, we would start with an ideal band pass response and from that we would calculate its um, impulse response and it's that idealized impulse response that we're applying a window to. The other thing that's happening here <clears throat> is that uh, we're applying a time delay to that idealized impulse response. This time delay is where the linear phase characteristics of the filter come from. M, remember, is the order of the filter, and so this delay is um, giving us our group delay. The group delay of this filter would be M over 2. And remember, for the different types of filters, M can be an even number, in which case M over 2 is an integer, or M can be an odd number, in which case M over 2 is an integer plus 1 half. So um, depending on the kind of problem that you're solving, if you're solving a high pass filter problem, a band stop filter problem, whatever that problem is, this, uh, the form of this function to which we are applying the window, um, that comes from this, the specification of the ideal filter. Okay, We'll look at some examples of this in a few minutes, but I just wanted to point out that there's a, a couple of pieces of this that um, have already been taken care of before we get to this um, flowchart. So what we need to do here, um, the, the whole goal of this flowchart is to select the window that will be used. And remember that there's two features of a window that are important. One is its length or its order, m, and the other is its shape. Um, so we'll, we'll choose the shape uh, first uh, based on the specification of the ripple or, or the passband ripple and the stop band attenuation or in terms of these error terms that, that uh, we saw on the previous slide. So, so a, a filter design problem, you might be given the, uh, the ripple and the stop band attenuation parameters in decibels or maybe you'll be given these other numbers in <clears throat> linear units, for example, delta P and delta S. Uh, depending on which parameters you're given, you can easily calculate the others using these formulas on this page. Uh, remember that the, um, the window shape determines the size of the side lobes of the window function and the size of the side lobes of the window function will in turn control the amount of ripple in the two bands which gives us the stop band attenuation and the pass band ripple. Um, so what we do is we uh, take the specification and we calculate delta um, and from delta we calculate this parameter A which has no subscript on it. The thing that uh, I want to point out here is uh, just to understand what's going on here is that for window for the windowed filter design method, the um, the ripple in both bands uh, are is equal, and so uh, we'll usually go with the smaller of the two ripple specifications. Uh, that gives us a delta, and then from delta we'll uh, convert that back into a parameter in decibels. Uh, the reason that we want to convert that into a number in decibels is so that we can uh, look up in a table what the appropriate shape should be. So we'll, we're going to go ahead one slide to the table, and then we'll come back here and finish this uh, flowchart. 
So here's the table. And um, as I said just a moment ago, what we're going to do is take that parameter A that we just calculated, and we're going to look it up in this table. And we're going to find a number uh, in this last column that is equal to or exceeds the uh, number that, that was given. So suppose uh, we were given a specification, we calculate this number A, and the number turns out to be 18, 18 decibels. So we'd come down into this table and we'd, we'd look and we'd say, okay, the first entry in the table, that's the rectangular window, and it has a stop band attenuation of 21. 21 exceeds the specification, which is 18, and so we can go with a rectangular window. On the other hand, if the specification turned out to give us the number 25 decibels of attenuation in the stop band, then we would have to use something like a Bartlett window, which exceeds that specification. If we had a specification that required 60 decibels of attenuation in the stop band, it appears that we would not be able to use a Hamming window because it would give us only 15, uh, 53 decibels of attenuation. What would be required is the use of a Blackman window which gives us 74 decibels of attenuation in the stop band. So um, based on the uh, parameter from the previous uh, chart, A, we come down into this table and we select the appropriate window shape. Now we're going to turn attention back to choosing how long should the window be. And to figure that out, we're going to have to come back to um, this column, which tells us how wide the transition band will be given the length of the filter, L. Let's look at this in the recipe. So uh, again, we're going to go back to our frequency specification. We're going to have a pass band edge and a stop band edge. Um, and that will give us our delta F parameter as the difference between the stop and pass band edges. Uh, from that delta F parameter, we can multiply by 2 pi and get delta omega. And then we go into the table for the, sh for the shape that we've already determined. And that will give us a constant that we can plug into this formula. And then we can solve for the appropriate length. Again, we're going to use uh, the entries in this column. So based on the um, the ripple performance in the two bands, we're going to select a shape. Once we've selected the shape, we'll come back to this column and that will give us a constant that we can plug into this formula here. Notice that all of the entries in the, in the table have that same form, so we're going to take the constant, plug it into this formula, and use this to calculate the length of the window. Once we have the length, we can calculate the order, which is the length minus 1, and then that will determine uh, what kind of uh, filter that we have. Uh, how will we know what kind of filter we have? What type of filter? One, two, three, or four? We'll go back to the uh, filter response and we'll, say, we'll ask ourselves, well, is this filter response an even function or an odd function? In this case, it's an even function. So that means we have types one or two. And um, then based on whether m is even or odd, uh, that will tell us whether we're type 1 or 2. And at this point, we can stop and ask ourselves, well, what kind of filter do we want to have? Do we want to have a type 1 or a type 2? And if you don't have the type that you want, you can always increase M by 1, and um, that's guaranteed not to uh, destroy the, specif you know, the specification. It's, you're not going to violate the spec by increasing the filter order by 1. Uh, anyway, so, so you do the adjustment uh, for filter type at the end of the process. But now what we have is we've determined the shape of the window, we've determined the length of the window, and then we can go back into standard uh, places um, where the formulas are for the windows. I haven't included those here. Um, they're they're um, in our textbook, they're on the internet, and they're built into any, many software libraries such as MATLAB. So you go and you design the filter uh, using the formulas in books and in the software. You know the shape, you know the length, so you can now calculate W of N. And then we just evaluate this function. We can calculate the impulse response of our filter um, by evaluating this function at N equals zero, 
1, 2, and so on up to capital M. And that gives us a filter of length L, M plus 1, and uh, the filter design is complete. At this point, what we do is we calculate the Fourier transform of our filter impulse response to get an approximation to the magnitude response. Usually we use a lot of zero padding in this part of the process so that we get a clear picture of the underlying function here. That's what zero padding does for us. And uh, we, we look at the filter that we've just designed and make sure it meets the specifications at the edges of the pass band and the stop band and we make sure that the ripples in the two bands uh, meet the specification. Now there's another window called the Kaiser window that uh, can be used to design FIR filters as well. In this case the Kaiser window has an adjustable parameter called beta that can be used to change the shape of the window. So um, now we don't have to select from among different windows, but we can choose this beta parameter to get the exact shape that we want to have. So uh, with the, the design procedure with the Kaiser window is uh, very similar to the design procedure that we were just looking at. The recipe is shown here. We again start with the amplitude specifications in the different bands, the attenuation and the passband ripple. Um, we follow a similar, similar procedure as before. We calculate the uh, parameter associated with the more restrictive uh, requirement, whether that's in the stop band or in the pass band. We co convert that into an A parameter uh, in dB. And then we bring that over into this uh, piecewise defined formula uh, that we apply for different values of A and what this does is this is an empirically uh, derived formula derived by Jim Kaiser to um, calculate the shape parameter. Now um, once we've uh, calculated this beta parameter we can use that in the calculation of the window. So again um, the Kaiser window, we'll look at the formula for this in just a minute, but it's the function of this parameter called beta. Um, notice that um, for uh, when A is less than 21 dB, we'll just use 0 for the, the shape parameter. This gives us a rectangular window. Um, when beta is between 21 and 50, we use this uh, two-term formula to calculate beta. And then when A is greater than 50, uh, we'll use this other uh, part of the formula to calculate beta. Um, what this does is it gives us a window shape that allows us to achieve the exact um, attenuation that we want. Notice that uh, with the other uh, shape selection method using this table that we were looking at before, if I wanted, for example, 60 dB of attenuation in the stop band, I would have to use a Blackman window. That gives me more attenuation than I need uh, and probably a longer filter as a result. Um, but uh, with the Kaiser window, therefore, we can obtain uh, shorter windows potentially and uh, have less computation. Um, once we've chosen the beta parameter that controls the shape, we still have to determine the length of the window. And again, Kaiser provides us with an empirical formula that we can use. It's a function both of the attenuation in the stop band or in one of the bands, the more restrictive band, as well as the uh, the transition band width. So you can see that as the transition band becomes narrower and narrower, um, the uh, length of the window becomes larger and larger. Also, as the attenuation increases, uh, the length of the window becomes larger. So um, we, we just basically plug into this formula to calculate the order. Uh, we, we add one to that to get the length. And then we adjust, as we did before, uh, the length or order to get the type of filter that we want to have. Once we have the shape parameter and the length, we plug into the Kaiser window formula, which is shown here, uh, to, to evaluate the window coefficients. Once we have the window coefficients, we apply those to the impulse response of the idealized filter, and that gives us our designed filter. At this point, we then go in and check the specifications, uh, the, the uh, frequency response of this actual filter, against the specifications to see if it meets the specs. If it doesn't, we'll go back in and probably increase the length of the filter uh, by a few coefficients 
or modify the shape parameter slightly to uh, get the response that we want. Um, back here uh, on the window shape, the, the window function, um, notice it's a function of n, which is the coefficient uh, that we're evaluating. n goes between 0 and m, where m is the order of the filter. And um, alpha is equal to m over 2, that is the group delay. And then uh, here's beta, the shape parameter, that comes into the picture as well. The last piece of this that's probably a little bit unfamiliar is this I0 function. It is the zeroth, zeroth order modified Bessel function of the first kind. And um, I've plotted that here just so you can see what the shape of this looks like. It's um, a fairly smooth, well-defined function. And uh, this can be evaluated numerically using software packages or looked up in tables. All right, next I'd like to talk about a piece of software that comes with the MATLAB signal processing toolbox. This is called the filter designer. So if, if in MATLAB you type filter designer and hit the enter key, it will pop up a window that looks like this when it first starts. There's a bunch of things that you can do with this. Um, we've talked so far about filter design using the window technique, but there are many other filter design um, approaches out there. Many of them are based on different kinds of optimizations, uh, cost functions and optimization problems. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of these um, at this time, uh, but you can go and read in our textbook about other methods and online. There's uh, many other techniques that, that are used for designing filters. The window de uh, filter design technique is a good method. Um, it's uh, it's one that you can use without a lot of hassle. It's very simple, doesn't require optimization, and leads uh, to you know good filters. But um, as we'll see, um, there are other approaches that also produce uh, good filters. In some cases, uh, and in many cases, better than the ones uh, that you can design with the filter method or the window method. So um, let me introduce you to this uh, piece of software. Um, uh, up in the top here, the top right in this filter specifications panel, you can see uh, a, a, a low-pass filter specification. Um, we have the passband uh, specif uh, envelope specified here. We've got the stop band envelope specified down here. We have the passband uh, ripple in dB specification, the stop band attenuation in dB. On the frequency axis, you can see that we're designing this um, the units are in hertz, but of course all of these things are selectable using the uh, specification boxes down below. So for example, uh, we can select either IIR or FIR low-pass filters. Uh, if, if we're in the FIR case, we can, we can select different kinds of filters. We'll just leave this at low-pass. We could select high-pass. Um, we could select band-pass, and notice that each time we select a different uh, type of filter, the sp filter specification changes. Uh, we could do band stop, there's differentiators and uh, Hilbert transformers and all sorts of things here that you can design. Let's go back to the simple low pass filter specification. Um, over here you can specify the filter order if you know what the order should be or if you want to you can ask MATLAB to find the minimum order filter for the specification that's given. Um, down here under the uh, filter design method, we'll go with um, equi ripple. Uh, this is an optimal um, minimum maximum error approach, but there are many others you can see here. Um, density factor, we'll just leave this at its default setting of 20. This has to do with how finely the um, frequency response is evaluated in the, in the frequency domain. And then over here under frequency specification, we can go with units of hertz, kilohertz, and so on. Or we could do a normalized frequency design where the units are between um, are normalized to 0 and 1. I'll, I'll note here that uh, MATLAB uses a frequency axis in units of radians per sample rather than cycles per sample. So um, uh, 1 for them, for MATLAB, is considered to be pi which is the highest sampling frequency. So I don't know if I want to do that um, at this time. I'll just go with uh, hertz and I'll specify a sampling rate of one hertz. Um, this will give us uh, 
uh, this this will normalize the frequency axis to to the way that we're accustomed to thinking about it with one half being the highest frequency. Um, then we'll put in a filter specification. Maybe I'll design a filter that has a pass band edge of two cycles per sample and a, a stop band edge of 0.3 cycles per sample. Um, in the magnitude specifications we can do linear magnitudes uh, where the D parameters are the delta parameters that we were looking at a little while ago or if we stay in DB um, these are the, um, the ripple parameters in DB that we were looking at a little while ago. Uh, maybe I'll put a 0.1 dB ripple in the pass band and maybe I'll say 60 decibels of attenuation in the stop band. Let's click now design filter and see what happens. Uh, this pops up a magnitude response for us and we can go in now and we can look at the um, filter specifications. I can zoom in on this. I could zoom in for example in the pass band and make sure that I have um, a ripple of less than one-tenth of a dB and it looks like I've met that specification here. In the stop band I'll notice that uh, my attenuation it doesn't quite meet the specification in the stop band because I, I asked for a stop band attenuation of 60 dB it looks like it's only giving me about 59. Nevertheless that's not a bad filter. Um, looks pretty good. The reason this is called equi-ripple is because if you look in the pass band, the size of the ripples is equal amplitude and in the stop band it's equal amplitude across the stop band as well. Um, let's go in now and, and let's just note that this is a 27th order filter. So um, the, if we wanted to look at the impulse response you can click this button up here on the top. Notice that we have even symmetry and that the point of symmetry is halfway in between these two middle samples. That's because we have an odd order. So when you take um, 27 divided by 2, that's 13 and a half. And that will be the group delay of this filter, 13 and a half. If we wanted to specify the order and say, oh, I'd like to make this a 28th order filter to change the filter type, uh, we'll redesign this filter. And now notice that the filter has an impulse response. It's 28th order. It has a group delay of 14, which is that center tap there in the filter, and we're symmetric about that center tap. If we go back and look at the magnitude response, um, we see that the magnitude response hasn't changed much. Um, we could go in and look at the different bands. Um, I also want to acquaint you with some of these other buttons at the top. Uh, we have one here that calculates the group delay. Notice that the group delay is constant across frequency. That's because this is a linear phase filter. And uh, the group delay is uh, 14. That's half of the order as expected. We can also make a plot of the phase response. Um, as expected, the phase is uh, linear across the pass band. It's linear across all of its um, bands. And um, what else do we have here? We also have a pole zero plot. So this shows us that um, we could zoom in on the unit circle here. We have one zero that's way outside the unit circle, but um, let's see if I can zoom in here. Getting there. Almost there. And um, just a few more zooms and we'll be there. There we go. Now we're looking at the pole zero plot. Uh, it was zoomed way out because it has a zero far outside the unit circle. But um, you can see some of the symmetries uh, in the, the zero structures that we were looking at previously. For example, this zero right here occurs in a foursome. Uh, it has a conjugate reciprocal pair, it has a conjugate pair, and then an, a reciprocal pair over here. So all of these zeros occur in foursomes. We also um, uh, have some unit circle zeros, and each of those occur in, in conjugate pairs. Uh, so that's some structure that we're familiar with seeing.
Here's a plot of the magnitude and the phase together. And there's several other buttons up here at the top. If you wanted to see what the impulse response coefficients were, you could, you could look at those. Um, let's see, I want to design one more filter because we've talked about uh, windowed filter design. So um, let's go back and put in our, our filter specification. We'll have a, a sampling rate of one sample per second. And we'll put the cutoff frequency at 0.25. Um, let's try a Hamming window. And um, we'll try a 28th order Hamming window and see if that um, meets the specification. You can see that uh, I wanted 60 dB of attenuation. I don't quite achieve that, but let's look in the passband and see what the attenuation in the passband is. Looks like I have uh, exceeded by far my passband uh, specification, which I wanted to be less than one tenth of a dB. But to get our um, specification in the in the mat in the uh, stop band, I'm going to have to increase the order of this filter. Let's try uh, 32 for our filter order and redesign the filter. Uh, it's not getting there. Let's go to 42. Um, it looks like the Hamming window is not going to do it. And we knew that that was the case because uh, the, the Hamming window has a stop band attenuation of uh, less than 60 dB. So in order to achieve the specification, we're going to have to go with the Blackman uh, filter. Let's go ahead and design that. And now it looks like we meet the specification um, in terms of the attenuation and the ripple in the different bands. But unfortunately now notice that our transition band specification is not met. We need to be below 60 dB by the time we get to um, 0.3 Hertz. We haven't met that specification. So how do we do that? How do we narrow the transition band? You go with a longer filter. So we're going to increase the length of the filter. This is very much a trial and error as I'm illustrating it here. We know we can follow the recipe and we don't have to do the trial and error. But it looks like now I've found a filter that meets the specification both in the stop band and in the pass band and, as, and the transition band as well. So anyway, um, there's a filter design. Uh, let's go with the Kaiser uh, window. And so for Kaiser, remember there's going to be two parameters that we will choose. I'm going to start with the Kaiser with a shape parameter of 5. We'll go uh, with the same order filter as the, with the Blackman. And uh, it looks like we're not quite meeting the specification, so if I change the shape, maybe make this bigger, I'll go with 7. And that uh, looks like it did the trick. It lowered that first um, uh, side lobe in the filter, and so it looks like we meet the specification. Um, there's a, a few other things that are worth looking at here. Besides FIR designs, we could also design IIR filters, and a Butterworth is a simple filter. Let's, let's take a look at maybe a third order Butterworth filter and see if it could meet the specification. So uh, let's see. Looks like we're not meeting it with a third order because 60 dB and, and 0.3 hertz is right here where my cursor is. And we're far, far above that. So let's uh, crank it up to maybe a sixth order Butterworth filter. Still not achieving it. And let's go to a twelfth order. And um, it looks like, no, we're still not quite meeting the specification there. Um, if we wanted, just, just for fun, let's take a look at the pole zero plot of this filter. I should have done it up here. And uh, yeah, these Butterworth filters have an interesting uh, placement for their poles and zeros. And now let's. Um, try maybe a different type of filter. Let's go with an elliptic filter, 12th order. You can see it's a pole zero pattern. Let's go look at the magnitude response. And it looks like, oh, whoops. Um, let's see, 1 hertz, 0 0.25. 
and it looks like it's easily meeting the specification. Go back and look at the Butterworth for a moment. Uh, not meeting the specification. Chubby Chev and elliptic type filters are able to um, have a little more flexibility in their design. Um, if we were to look at the impulse response coefficients, um, oops. You can see what those are by clicking some of these buttons. Um, let's see, I wanted to, to look at uh, another example here, Chebyshev Type 1. I want to go back to a lower order filter. Let's go with a fourth order filter and see if we can meet the spec with a fourth order filter. And um, looks like maybe we don't have quite the response we want to get. Let's see, this is a fourth order elliptic filter. Again, it's not meeting the specification, uh, but we are getting close. Uh, it looks like this one is very close. Let's try maybe a eighth order. And this one, this one meets the specification. You can see there in the stop band, we meet the spec. And um, in the pass band, I believe we're meeting the specification as well. Okay, so uh, those are a few thoughts. Um, if, you, if you want to um, export these filters into the MATLAB workspace, you can go File, Export. And um, I'll export these as coefficients. And we'll export the, that. Then if we go over to the workspace, we can see what those variables are and we can um, implement, uh, use this filter design tool to design the filter and then take the coefficients out of MATLAB and use those in MATLAB code or in our own C code to implement the filter. So the filter designer is a very useful tool. Again, um, it can show us things like group delay, it can show us phase response, um, it calculates these things very easily, it shows us poles and zeros, uh, magnitude response, and um, it's very easy to quickly iterate through different types of filters, uh, high pass, low pass, band stop, band pass, FIR, IIR, um, play around with the, the specification, the frequency, um, band edges, and the pass band, stop band, attenuation factors. Uh, so a tool like this is extremely valuable because you can try lots of different designs and find the one that generally ha meets the specification and gives you, um, generally you would like to have a low order filter because that, the order of the filter has, um, has a direct impact on the amount of work you have to do to, um, uh, when, when you apply the filter to a signal.